Hello, and welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. Today, I am joined by the magnificent Sharon Bennett Connolly to talk about the women of the anarchy. You are not going to want to miss this episode because it is just full of strong, empowered women, and I can't wait to share it with you. The Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Sharon, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. Oh, thank you for coming on and talking about this fascinating subject with me because I've always been interested, at least in the story of Empress Matilda. And so uh, today we're talking about the anarchy and the women of the anarchy. And I'm so excited to get started with you on this conversation. But before we go too deep, I want to know what was it that got you intrigued enough to want to write a book on these women? Well, like you said, I'm the same as you. I've always had a fascination for Empress Matilda. I think she was, she's was she been hard done by, um, both in her own life and by history. She's always portrayed as this haughty woman who shouldn't have been given the throne anyway because she was so bossy. And it's like, poor woman. All she wanted to do was gain her inheritance, but she's always... She, Stephen's King Stephen's always been seen as this nice guy and Matilda as the one who didn't deserve the throne because she was too nasty so I've always had a soft soft spot for her but when I started writing my first book she's not in it um my first book Heroines of the Medieval World because I was as I was writing it I thought she would be in it and then as I I was writing it I thought her story is actually too long to be just uh 2500 words in a book So I'd already thought then that I'll do one if I get the opportunity, then I would do one about her. And originally I did think of just doing a biography of Empress Matilda, but Catherine Hanley um, brought one out um, just as I was thinking, considering doing it, um, which is absolutely excellent. And there's also the Marjorie Chibnall one, which is the industry standard one. So I thought, "Mm, I need to rethink this. And then I thought of actually, doing one about Empress Matilda and Queen Matilda of Boulogne, Stephen's wife, because she often gets overlooked. And yet she was such a strong woman. And she was the one who kept the fight going when Stephen was imprisoned. So I actually thought, if I do one where you've got the opposing Matildas and see where that goes, and I'm hoping it's turned out all right. It was certainly very interesting to write. And nice to bring Queen Matilda out as much as it was to tell Empress Matilda's story. They've both got such incredible stories that it's nice to turn the focus on them and to put Stephen sort of in the background a little bit. I I think it's so fascinating that you said, you know, we forget that Stephen had a wife. And at the moment you said that, I thought, oh my gosh, she is totally right. Because we never, we just think of him and Empress Matilda, just those yeah. two in this story. So I'm so glad that you brought this story to the forefront so that we could learn some more about mm-hmm. this this queen and his wife. But before any of that started is one of my favorite historical stories is the white trip, the white ship tragedy. So um, for those who are unfamiliar, and I'm sure there are quite a few people who are listening to this podcast who maybe have never heard of the white ship tragedy. Mm-hmm. There are some who've probably know everything about it, but why don't you give the listeners a background? Let's just say for those who are unfamiliar with the story, tell us about it and the effect of, of this tragedy. Yes. Well, the white ship disaster happened in 1120. It wasn't the cause of the anarchy, but it was the catalyst for it. Um, Because the only surviving male heir, a legitimate male heir of Henry I, died in the White Ship tragedy. He was a 16 year old boy known as William the Athling. And he had been destined for the crown from the moment he was born. He'd been trained to be king. He was supposed to be very well accomplished. He'd just got married to Matilda of Anjou. Um, He had the world in front of him. And there's this um, ship's master, I think his name was Fitzstephen, who just got this magnificent ship, the white ship, uh, Blanche Neff in French. And he offered it to King Henry, offering to take Henry from France 
to England. And Henry said, no, it's OK. I've got my own ship. I'll go in my own ship. But William said, um, yes, I'll take it because he was supposed to be the sh fastest ship in the world at that time. You know, they, it's like the Titanic, you know, they they <laughs> they claim it's unsinkable. It's the fastest ship and, you know, disaster is going to happen. But <laughs> nobody thinks twice, you know, they go, oh, yeah, we'll take it. And mm. they set off um, around midnight and um, didn't even clear harbour, basically. The ship ran into um, an underground rock that split it in two, and everybody but a butcher uh, were killed. So 300 souls drowned, and um, including William the Athling, uh, and two other children from Henry I, two of his illegitimate children, a son and a daughter, were also killed. So it was quite a disaster for poor Henry. Yeah, um, and you know, men... before you go on, though, you have to tell the story about how William tried to save his sister. Oh, yes, they did. When as soon as they knew the ship was sinking, they got William into a rowboat and rowed him away from the ship, from the sinking ship. But of course, everybody's screaming, help me, help me. And apparently William heard his sister, Matilda, uh, Matilda of Chester, she was, Countess of Chester, um, shouting for help. So he insisted they row back to help her. Now, to be fair, any of the women on that ship, as soon as they went into the water, that would have been it. They would have drowned, no doubt. You know, women had long, heavy dresses on. Um, they would have stood no chance. So he knew that if he didn't save his sister, she would she would drown. Unfortunately, as they rowed back to the ship, everybody tried to get on this rowboat and it was only a little rowboat, apparently. So there's all these people grabbing onto the side to try and save themselves. And as a result, they sank the boat and William with it. How tragic, really. It is. It's just such a sad. I mean, you can imagine how desperate they all were. And in William trying to save his sister, he doomed himself and everybody on that robot, not just himself, the people who were rowing. Right. Him to safety. Yeah. And then somebody had to go back to England and tell the king, <laughs> your heir is dead. Yeah. Um, they weren't exactly keen on doing that. They ended up getting a child to do it because they thought Henry probably wouldn't just kill a child. Um, if he was giving him bad news. So they they got a child to go to Henry and tell him what had happened because none of them, none of his leading nobles dare actually tell him that his son was dead. And it did take him a little while before they actually told him. Wow. You know, the, the thing that's interesting to me about this whole story is that there's so much backstory to it. And there it's is. kind of... It's how you open your book too, is you tell us the backstory of Henry the first and his life. And this is a time period as well that I'm fascinated. And actually that second podcast that I'm starting is going to be all about William the Conqueror. So when I saw in your book that you were talking about this, I thought this is fantastic because this is a story that so needs to be told. So let's, let's go back in time a little bit. We now know Henry the first, you know, was King he had an heir um, that died in a tragedy, and that's where we're going to pause that story for now. Let's go back now to William the Conqueror and how that story unfolded to Henry becoming king. Yeah, well, that's the thing. When you, when you decide you're going to write about a particular period, you suddenly realize you can't write about that period in isolation because that's not the whole story. Yeah. Henry I was the youngest son of William the Conqueror and his wife, Matilda of Flanders. And I'm writing about the winning women of the anarchy. And Matilda, of, sorry, not, yeah, Matilda of Flanders. I'm <laughs> getting my Matildas mixed up. <laughs> There's a lot of Matildas yes. in the book. Um, so you can't really write about Henry, about the anarchy until you tell the backstory of the women involved from the very beginning. So I actually start with Matilda of Flanders and um, St. Margaret, the Queen of Scots. Because Matilda of Flanders is Henry's mother. St. Margaret is the mother of Henry's wife, Matilda of Scotland, who 
is also in the book because she's the mother of Empress Matilda. And Matilda of Scotland's sister, Mary, is the mother of Matilda of Boulogne, King Stephen's wife. So it's nice to have Margaret and Mary because it's nice to have different names rather yes. than the mother of Matilda. <laughs> It can be quite confusing. I think I'm going to have to have like a, a key for the listeners to follow as, as they're listening to this episode, because you're right, there is a lot of, yeah. and they all start with M too. So that yeah. makes it equally as confusing. So it was, it was a challenge with the book. And I decided early on, I wasn't, you read a lot of historical fiction with Empress Matilda, and they change her name to Maud. Mm-hmm. And they call her Empress Maud. And it's like, but well, she wasn't Empress Maud. <laughs> she didn't know herself as Empress Maud. She wasn't referred to as Empress Maud in her lifetime. But in order to distinguish her between her and Matilda of Boulogne, she loses her name. And I thought, that's not happening in my book. She is Empress Matilda. Um, so she is always referred to in the book as Empress Matilda or Matilda of England. And then Stephen's wife is always referred to as Matilda of Boulogne or Queen Matilda. So that you can tell, you know, there's always empress or queen. So you know which one I'm talking about. There you go. Okay, (laughs) so so now we're looking at William the Conqueror. And now that we've said Matilda, Maud, and Mary, and Margaret 800 times, (laughs) who, can you remind me now again, who was the wife of William the Conqueror? That was Matilda of Flanders. Okay. And she was a very strong, um, capable woman. When... William the Conqueror invaded England in 1066. He left her in charge of Normandy and she was regent in Norm- for Normandy whenever William was in England, which was quite a lot in the early years. Definitely, you know, he was fighting in 1066 and then again the harrying of the North in 1068. And during all this time, Matilda of Flanders is in Normandy holding down the fort for Normandy and doing a really good job of it. And she even financed one of the ships for the invasion of England, the Mora. She actually paid for that to be built for Mm. William and it was his flagship. So it showed her support for the invasion of England. She was a very strong, independent woman. And I think it's quite telling that none of her three, none of her three surviving sons actually married until Matilda Flanders was dead. You know, she was, um, I think they were all mummy's boys, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> so whereas sons usually married quite young, it was, no, they all, you know, not while Matilda was alive. So yeah, she was a very strong influence on Henry the I. And um, you see throughout Henry, actually, his wife, Matilda of Scotland, was another strong woman who acted as regent when he was away in Normandy. And of course, his daughter, Empress Matilda, was an incredibly strong woman. So she had plenty of examples of independent women um, before her. So she knew she could rule. It's just the men didn't. We always forget that before Queen Mary the First, that there were other women who were completely capable of yeah. running countries and ruling empires. There's so many of them back then, but of mm. course, it was such a misogynistic and sexist world that there was no way a woman could actually do those things and be yeah. a sole ruler. They had to have that man next to them. Mm. It's sad, really. I was saying the other day that if she had actually managed to get the crown, or if they'd accepted her as queen in 1135 when Henry I died, it would have changed history because Henry VIII would have had an example of a woman ruling effectively 200 years before him. So, Sorry, 400 years before him. So would he have been so insistent on having a son if he knew that women could rule? Right. Even more so if you even go back to Henry VII and his concern for having an heir and a spare after Arthur died, maybe Elizabeth of York would still have been alive. Yeah. And maybe her continuing influence on Henry VIII yes. would have meant he turned out very differently from in the first place anyway. So, yeah, <laughs> it's just... Just that one little thing, Stephen usurping the throne um, caused Mm. all those problems for the Tudors. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, so Henry I um, was, correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm just going off the top of my head, was the 
only child or the only son that was born in England to William? Yeah, all his other children, um, save one, were born before he became King of England. Henry was the only son who was born in the purple, so to speak. He was the only son born after his father became king. His sister Adela was also born after William became king, but Henry was the only son born mm. to a king. So he actually believed when William II died in 1100 and Henry claimed the throne while his oldest brother Robert was coming back from crusade, Henry actually believed he had a better right to it anyway because he was born as the son of a king rather than the son of a mere duke like Robert was. <laughs> right. Okay, you can't just skim over the like the drama of the story that Henry claimed, you know, the throne for himself. Something happened <laughs> <laughs> that might be seen as maybe a little bit suspicious as to um, how he came about this. I think if I had been a Norman, I would have stayed away from the New Forest. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because William II wasn't the only son of the Conqueror who was killed in the New Forest. He had, um, there was an older brother, I think it was between Robert and William, called Richard. And he was killed hunting in the New Forest when he was only 12 years old. Hmm. So it did, and I think one of Henry the First illegitimate sons was killed hunting in the new forest as well it was not a nice place for normans i just got this image of one bloke hidden behind a tree with a bow and arrow and every time he sees a norman let's loose <laughs> <laughs> that does seem a little bit like what happened <laughs> yes well exactly william ii was killed while hunting in the new forest he was killed by an arrow which apparently glanced off a tree and then hit him in a, in the chest Hmm. which is a little bit odd to say the least because a narrow glancing off a tree would actually it would change its trajectory but it would also take away some of its force which would mean the impact would be likely to be less rather than being able to pierce somebody's chest so there is you can understand where the conspiracy theory comes from uh, and yeah. supposedly the the no one knows whether it was murder or just an accident. But Henry took advantage of it straight away, wrote to Winchester, which wasn't far away, secured the treasury, and then wrote to London and got himself crowned king. All while not actually bothering about his brother's body. Somebody was eventually sent back in with a cart to collect the king's body, and he was buried in Winchester. But... Henry's primary concern, he sees his brother struck with an arrow. And instead of saying, somebody help my brother, yeah. he goes right to the treasury. <laughs> right, it all just comes off so suspicious. Like it, it makes you want to scratch your head a little bit and say, well, did people not like of the time not realize how suspicious it, it was? <laughs> or is it just because, of course, we're so far removed from it now we look back and go, come on, clearly he had him murdered. <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, I don't think anyone was particularly bothered who became king, whether it was Henry or Robert. I think most people would have preferred Henry anyway, because he seemed more practical and more capable than Robert. Robert was a great soldier. He was a great crusader, but he wasn't a very good administrator. Mm. And he mortgaged Normandy so he could go on crusade. And then Henry felt so little about him that when he defeated defeated Robert later on he actually offered to manage Normandy let Robert be, remain duke but Henry would manage Normandy and would pay Robert to just go and hunt all the time <laughs> um so he didn't think much of his older brother anyway and eventually he did capture him and imprison him for Oh, God, decades. I think he was imprisoned for three decades in the end wow. um, in England. And he only died a year or two before Henry I did. Okay, so here's where I'm going to get, I'm getting confused again with all the Matildas and the M names. So <laughs> when Henry, and I'm sure the listeners are too, so let's just try to make this as simple as possible. When Henry I claimed the throne, was he married at that time? 
He wasn't married when he claimed the throne. He married shortly afterwards. And he married, and this is where it gets even more confusing, a lady named Edith of Scotland. It would have been ever so handy if she'd stayed being named Edith of Scotland, but <laughs> no. On her marriage to Henry, she changed her name to Matilda. Why? To, I think, to actually annoy future biographers. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you go from Edith to Matilda? I don't understand. I think Edith was too Anglo-Saxon mm. a name for the Normans to stomach, to be honest. So he like it was changed to a more Norman acceptable name. Yeah. So because okay. In this time you're still only forty-four years, thirty-four years after the Norman conquest. So it's still a little. Um, tentative that the Normans are the conquerors and they wanted to make sure everybody knew they were the conquerors. So the last thing they wanted was people to know that he was marrying an Anglo-Saxon. So it was like they needed her to be a Norman. Mm. And actually one of his um, barons, the Earl Warren, um, called him and um, Matilda Goda and Godgifu or something and actually um, made jokes about them being more Anglo-Saxon than Norman so it was yeah. <laughs> it was derided the Anglo-Saxon link was derided slightly so it was um, to make sure that she was a Norman well, it was just so it, that identity was so important to them back yeah, then it was that's it I'm going to start calling her Edith slash Matilda yeah, a lot of people do. And I was tempted to in the book, but in the end, I just went with Matilda of Scotland yeah. and kept going, you know, because otherwise you're going, Edith called Matilda. And it's like, oh, it was confusing. Yeah. So Edith slash Matilda of Scotland clearly is from Scotland. Yes. But can you maybe go a little bit deeper into her heritage? Well, us. she had a better claim, technically, she had a better claim to the throne of England than her husband did, because her mother was Margaret of Wessex, uh, Queen of Scots, who was saint, she was made a saint uh, eventually. But she was the daughter of Edward the Exile, who was the son of Edmund Ironside, who was the son of Ethelred II. So Matilda of Scotland could actually trace her lineage all the way back to Alfred the Great. Mm. so she was of the anglo-saxon royal line and that's why their son william was known as william the athling because athling in the anglo-saxon days was um the name given to the heir to the throne it meant throne worthy so they oh. actually they did actually incorporate some of the anglo-saxon traditions into the norman royal family to to show that they were inheriting Alfred the Great's throne and that there was still legitimacy through Alfred the Great. Mm. William the Athling would have been, if he'd been king, then he would have been, he was directly descended from Alfred the Great, which was in those days a very big deal. Yeah, uh, it's so, <laughs> you tell this story and I'm connecting all of these dots now because the Normans were really the Vikings, right? Yes. Oh, yes, if we want to go all the way back, the Normans were descended from Rollo of Normandy, who was a Viking raider. And um, yeah, they'd settled that Normandy means land of the Norse. You know, it was, they were the Norse men. So yeah, they they were Vikings. <laughs> well, and then that adds a, another level to the whole story because William the Conqueror then was Norman. He yeah. comes to England as this viking type guy <laughs> which of course you know if we go back to alfred the great as well with you know alfred trying to to get the danes out of the country yeah. like it's all just this weird circle and yeah. they just can't let go of their bias towards <laughs> each other really i think yeah. is what it comes down to it's funny it must have been quite a melting pot in the 11th century because and you also have to remember when you're looking at 1066, 
we see it as the Normans invading England and conquering England, and suddenly we have this Norman dynasty, whereas we'd had an Anglo-Saxon one before, except we hadn't. From 1000 to 1066, we'd had three Anglo-Saxon kings and three Viking kings. Because we'd had, well, four, if you count um, Swain Forkbeard, who'd only been king for six weeks. You had Swain Forkbeard, King Canute, Canute's son, Harold Harefoot, who was Harold I, and Canute's other son, Harthur Canute. So, and for the English, you'd had Ethelred II, Edmund Ironside, and Edward the Confessor, and then Harold II in 1066. So we weren't actually that used to we were used to changing dynasties and had been doing that for the last 60 odd years <laughs> so when the normans came along it wasn't this big defeat of the english and new norman dynasty we were actually quite used to changes of dynasties quite frequently right it probably seemed like nothing like you said it wasn't that big of a deal when Henry took the throne from his brother because they were like, whatever, it's just another yeah. king. Yeah, it was um, It's just the way it had been happening for years. So where we see it as a big cultural shock, um, it wasn't because that kind of warfare had been going on since Alfred the Great's time. Right. Okay, so here we are now. Uh, Henry the I is king. He's married to Edith slash Matilda of Scotland. <laughs> um, they start having kids. And help me understand the genealogy here. How many legitimate kids did they have together? They had at least two, possibly three. It's possible that there was another son who died in, chi in childhood. But they definitely had William the Atheling and Matilda who was known as, I think it was Adelaide when she was born. Oh. Yeah, it I wasn't even... Matilda. <laughs> Her name was changed to Matilda when she got married. <laughs> <laughs> when she went to Germany. she At the age of eight, she was sent to Germany to marry the, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry. Um, she didn't marry him at the age of eight, but she was sent to Germany then, and she continued her education in Germany and married Henry when she was, I think she was a month shy of her 12th birthday. Wow. So, okay. So she became Empress then. Yes. Okay. So did that title of Empress hold as much weight as it did in the 16th century? Yes, it really did. And this is the thing that gets me about the anarchy and not wanting a woman to rule. Matilda had been trained to rule from childhood. From the age of eight, when she went to the empire, she was trained to rule. She was given a thorough, solid education. And she was left in charge of the empire when her husband went to war. She, she acted as regent for him. She issued charters. She made judgments. It's even possible that she suggested her father's second wife, Adeliza of Louvain. She actually, she and Empress Matilda and Adeliza were very similar ages. And Adeliza's father was a count in the empire. So the Empress Matilda would have known him. And she actually, we know she knew him, actually. She helped him out of um, a jam um, when she was still a teenager. So we know that she knew Adeliza's father. And it's, I think she probably recommended to her dad, actually, there's this Adeliza. She's lovely. I know the family. And she'd make a good queen. And give you an heir, right? Yeah. Which was... Which she didn't. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so after the white ship tragedy, uh, they were left wondering who's going to take over the throne. Yeah. And, and oh, go ahead. Henry remarried really sooner. The way the marriage was probably already arranged, actually, um, because he married the White Ship tragedy was November the twenty fifth, and he remarried in January, the following year. So the marriage was probably already arranged, and it might have been brought forward a little bit in order for the fact that Henry needed an heir. So he married Adeliza of Louvain. Unfortunately, they didn't have any children. 
Adeliza was blamed, blamed for it because um, women in those days, if they didn't have a child, it was their fault. It wasn't the husband's fault, mm -hmm. especially when the husband, Henry, can point to, yes, I've only got two legitimate children, but look at these 20 odd illegitimate children. You know, all I have to do is look at a woman and she's pregnant. Right. Look at how manly I am. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but despite that, they didn't have any children. Now, it wasn't Adeliza's fault. We know that because in her second marriage, she had seven children. Hmm. So it just wasn't working. You know how they say chemistry? Yeah. Well, I think with Henry and Adeliza, the chemistry wasn't there because it wasn't <laughs> working for either of them. They both had children separately, but not together. So Henry, after he married again in 1121, um, no children were forthcoming, so he had to look at other ideas. At the same time, or shortly afterwards, his sister Adela, who was married to Stephen of Blois, I can't pronounce Blois. I speak <laughs> French, but I can't pronounce Blois. It always sounds like I'm throwing up. I do the same thing, Blois. <laughs> Blois. <laughs> it, does, it does sound like you're throwing up. <laughs> So she sent, Adela, Adela sent, had several sons and not enough lands to satisfy all of them. So she sent Stephen, a younger son, to Henry to be raised at the English court and hopefully get lands there. Um, um, her Another of her sons, Henry of Blois, was sent to England to be trained in the church as well. He became Bishop of Winchester. But Stephen joined Henry's court and was given lands, became a knight, and possibly seen by Henry as his future heir. Because at the time, Empress Matilda was in Germany. She hadn't had children yet, but there was still time. And it was likely that her life would always be in Germany. So he had to think of an alternate heir. So I think he started training Stephen to be his heir. He gave Stephen um, a brilliant marriage with Matilda of Boulogne. Boulogne was a very, very rich county, had lands on both sides of the channel in England and in Boulogne, mm. had um, a rich fleet of merchant navy and was everything a bloke could want. Matilda of Boulogne was the sole heiress so Stephen would inherit the county of Boulogne. And indeed, as soon as Stephen and Matilda of Boulogne married, Matilda's father re resigned the county to them, oh. to both of them, and retired to a, com to a monastery. So Stephen was now Count of Boulogne, had a wife who was, had been trained to rule Boulogne herself, so she was very capable. Empress Matilda was in Germany, and then her husband died. In 1125, the emperor died and the empress, she hadn't any children, so she wasn't going to be regent to a, child, a son who was emperor. Um, she had no emotional interest in Germany beyond the fact that she'd grown up there. So she was, and Henry needed an heir. So she was recalled to England. Henry's, he had been thinking of Stephen, but suddenly his daughter was available again and she was his blood. Right. Um, so he recalled Empress Matilda to England, had the barons, all of them, including Stephen, swear to uphold Matilda, Empress Matilda's claim to the throne and then married her off to Geoffrey of Anjou so that she could have children and sons to inherit the crown eventually. And um, as far as Henry was concerned, that was it. Empress Matilda was going to inherit the crown when he died and uh, hopefully have sons. Um, unfortunately, the marriage between Empress Matilda and Geoffrey of Anjou wasn't um, the strongest. I mean, she was 28, I think it was, and Geoffrey was 14. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The most auspicious start. He was <laughs> still very much a child. He may he was supposed he was very handsome apparently, but he was still very um well, he was a teenage boy. Can you imagine it? A grown woman having to marry a teenage boy. She wasn't impressed. She left him and came home to her dad, <laughs> um, had to be persuaded to go back to him. And they did eventually have children. They had three sons, the eldest being Henry, the future Henry the Second. 
So even before Henry I died, Empress Matilda had a son she could point to to say he's going to be King of England one day. Except yeah. when Henry I died, Stephen claimed the throne. Empress Matilda was pregnant with her third son. She'd had a really bad time during the birth of her second son and nearly died. So she wasn't in a fit state to challenge Stephen in 1135 um, for the throne. And mm. he stole the jump on her, basically. He had all the resources of Boulogne behind him. And I think he'd probably been planning a while because he'd been talking to the barons and persuading them to back mm. him. And some of them seized control of Rouen in Normandy and other areas as Henry I died for Stephen so that Stephen could just hop over the channel and get himself crowned before Empress Matilda knew what was what was happening. It's like Henry I said, here are my wishes. All the lords yeah. and barons crossed their fingers and put them behind their back yeah. and Stephen did the same thing. And as soon as mm -hmm. he died, they're like, yeah, no, we're not going to have yeah, a woman exactly. ruling us. <laughs> yeah. And you hear a lot, actually, you know, everybody says, oh, it wasn't just because she was a woman. You get a lot of historians saying, no, it wasn't because she was a woman. It was because nobody wanted Geoffrey of Anjou to rule. And it's like, but that's because she was a woman. You right. Know, if and I say, William Athlin, her, older, her brother, had been married to Matilda of Anjou, but nobody said at any time, nobody wanted him to be king because they didn't want Matilda of Anjou as queen because she was just his, she'd just be his wife, so she'd have no power. The problem was that because Empress Matilda was a woman, it was envisaged that her husband would be the one to rule, in spite of the fact that Henry I had actually made the oath clear that it was Empress Matilda who would be queen and not Geoffrey of Anjou. But everybody thought Geoffrey would have the influence. So they didn't want Geoffrey. And that's, you get a lot of historians who go, no, it wasn't misogyny, saying it was because they didn't want Geoffrey. It's like, but that's still misogyny. Right. Because it's, they, it was Empress Matilda who would rule. But they saw it, they argued that Geoffrey would, we didn't want Geoffrey. And you would not have that situation if it was a man ruling right it's out I, I always use the similarity to mary the first and philip the second that was mm. the same concern she yeah. became queen regnant and they were like oh hang on if you get married we can't yeah. have your husband ruling it, it was no different 400 yes. years earlier except the difference is with mary the first she was quite happy for philip to rule she was she tried to get them to let him have the crown the actual crown whereas empress matilda didn't want jeffrey ruling <laughs> she didn't even want to be with jeffrey <laughs> so okay so stephen swoops in takes the throne after matilda gives birth to their second son mm -hmm. at what point is she recovered enough to try and fight back well 1138 there was some conflict in Normandy in 1137, where Stephen went over to put down um, an uprising, um, which didn't go exactly to plan. And a lot of his young barons decided they weren't having any of it and went back to England and left Stephen to it. Um, and I think Geoffrey of Anjou was behind that, pushing into Normandy. When, as far as he was concerned, he wasn't bothered about England but he desperately wanted Normandy. So when you look at the war, the whole anarchy, you see Empress Matilda in England because she wants the crown that her father gave her. But Geoffrey consigns himself to Normandy, to conquering Normandy, becoming Duke of Normandy, and then handing it on to his son, Henry II, who he names Duke of Normandy in, in, in the late 1140s, before, long, a few years before he dies. So he's not bothered about England anyway. So the barons needn't have been worried, <laughs> to be honest. He couldn't care less about England. He wants Normandy. Empress Matilda wants England. Her brother in 1138, in 1135, her illegitimate half-brother, Robert of Gloucester, had 
sworn an oath to Stephen. By 11.38, he'd decided that Stephen wasn't the man for the job, renounced his oath and swore an oath to Empress Matilda, visited Empress Matilda and said, I'm on your side. And Matilda brings a small army to England and <laughs> technically to visit her family. So she lands... Hang on a second. She brings an army to England to visit <laughs> her family? She's visiting her family. <laughs> she lands near Arundel Castle, which just happens to be owned by her stepmother, Adeliza of Louvain. Now, Adeliza's husband, William Daubigny, is a firm supporter of King Stephen. So there's this idea whether or not she knew Matilda was invading... Um, we don't know. She just, Adeliza passes it off as Matilda's just visiting. With um, her army. <laughs> yeah. I think she had something like 300 knights with her, wow. which is a pretty big army in those days. So she lands, stays at Arundel Castle. Stephen marches his army to the castle. He knows that Daubigny is on his side, but he knows the Empress is inside the castle. So he negotiates. And Stephen is a very noble, very chivalric man. Um, because he's like, he won't make war on women. So he allows Empress Matilda to leave Arundel Castle and gives her a safe conduct to visit her brother, Robert, at Bristol. And so she and her army just toddle off to Bristol. <laughs> This is the crazy. Okay, hang on. <laughs> so she brings an army with her to visit her family. Stephen brings an army with him to visit. <laughs> it's like this weird family reunion with everybody <laughs> pointing arrows at each other. Yeah, it is. But he basically lets her go and lets her join up with her brother. And that's when the real insurrection and the, the war starts. Wow. It makes you wonder, like, what was Stephen thinking? Why would he just let her go? <laughs> There's this thing with Stephen. He does things, and you're just like, why did he do that? And you can imagine most of his barons <laughs> next to him with their hands over their eyes going, oh, my God, he's done it again. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is an idiot. What is he doing? Probably doing Stephen a little disservice here, but I do think of him like that. I, somebody said to me the other day, "What do you think of Stephen?" And I'm like, "He's a wuss." <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like that. Okay, so he he lets her go. Yeah. And then what happens? Well, then the the war starts in earnest. Um, Empress Matilda's uncle, who just happens to be King of Scotland, invades in the north. Um, gets roundly defeated at the Battle of the Standard at North Allerton. But in the peace treaty, which is actually negotiated by the Bishop of Durham and Matilda of the Loin, Stephen's wife, um, the Scots are treated very favourably uh, because they're trying to persuade them to go home and not get involved anymore. So they give um, the King of Scots' son a wife, Ada de Warren, and give them don't make them pay too dearly for having invaded England and hope that David will therefore stay neutral. Because whereas where David's invaded to support his niece, Empress Matilda, that means he's in, invaded to not support his niece, Matilda of Boulogne. You know, he's uncle to both women. Right. <laughs> it's a weird situation. But throughout, actually, the whole anarchy, David supports Empress Matilda rather than Matilda of Boulogne. Because... To be fair, Empress Matilda is the rightful Queen of England. Right. She should be. Exactly. <laughs> so you get all these, um, <laughs> you know how they say the Wars of the Roses is the Cousins' War? Yeah. No, it's the anarchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the so anarchy is the Cousins' War. It makes me wonder then, as you're talking about all this, do we have any evidence of these women working together behind the scenes? Look, like I say, we do have Adelaide of Louvain welcoming Empress Matilda. Yeah. Um, we have the best part. I'm not sure that's the quite the right phrase for a part a period in a war, but for me, the most interesting part of the whole war is 1141, 
which is actually called, the year is called the War of the Two Matildas, which I only found out when I was researching these, the anarchy. And I'm like, the War of the Two Matildas. I mean, the, it is the only instance I know of in English history, maybe in European history, where women head the opposing armies. Because on 2nd of February, the anniversary is tomorrow, 1141, King Stephen fights the Battle of Lincoln and gets not only defeated, but captured. Mm. And he gets put in prison for most of the year. Um, he's put in Bristol Castle. He does try to escape once, so he ends up putting chains in Bristol Castle and held captive. So Empress Matilda has technically won. She now goes on a progress through southern England, goes to Winchester, claims the um, treasury, and makes her way to London and is preparing to have herself crowned. She thinks, you know, not everybody's coming to fall at her knees and say, oh, Empress Matilda, you are our queen. But the king's in prison, so nobody, There's, as far as she's concerned, there's nobody to argue with her, right. except Matilda of Valois. Just because her husband's in prison <laughs> doesn't mean she has to give up, because she's still got her son, her eldest son Eustace, who will be king after Stephen. So she's got something to fight for in her son. You know, she's got to get Stephen out of prison. And she's got to make sure her son inherits the throne. So she starts leading the armies and she leads an army up to the gates of London to Westminster, where Empress Matilda is sat having dinner one night um, in preparation for a coronation. And the London mob rise against her. The Queen Matilda is on the other side of the wall and she's basically chased out of Westminster and out of London, the Empress. Mm -hmm. um, they had to leave so quickly that apparently their dinner was still on the table, going cold while they were riding to safety in the West Country. So mm -hmm. you've got this situation where, yes, the king's in prison, yes, Empress Matilda's won, but Queen Matilda won't accept it and doesn't and will carry on the fight. And Empress Matilda has been named Lady of the English. All she has to do is be crowned. And Queen Matilda stops it. How? And it's just, a, and you have this sudden change around. By August, Empress Matilda is in Winchester besieging the castle of Bishop Henry of Winchester, Stephen's brother. And Queen Matilda then decides that she's going to attack as well. So you've got Empress Matilda, Matilda besieging Winchester Castle and Queen Matilda comes up behind her and starts besieging Empress Matilda in Winchester. So, and then the town gets set on fire and suddenly the Empress can't defend Winchester. She's caught between the castle defenders and the Empress and Queen Matilda attacking. So she has to run away. Sorry. To retreat. <laughs> a technical <laughs> retreat, a tactical retreat rather than run away. She didn't but she yeah, they had to retreat and get out of Winchester and she made for devices. Her brother, Robert of Gloucester, um leads a leads the defense. He he's last man standing. He and his troops stay in the way of Queen Matilda to give the Empress time to get away. Unfortunately, he gets captured. So now you've got, yes, King Stephen's in the hands of Empress Matilda, but the Empress's general is in the hands of Queen Matilda. <laughs> and they have to do this elaborate swap where, let me just remember the way it's done. Queen Matilda gives herself up as hostage for Stephen's release. Stephen is released and has to go to um, Rochester in Kent to get Robert released. And once Robert is released, then Queen Matilda 
gets released because everyone's back where they should be. It was nobody trusted anybody. But by the end of 1141, you've had this year where the two Matildas have been technically face to face with their armies fighting each other. But by the end of it, everybody's back where they were a year ago. Stephen's back on his throne. Empress Matilda is further away from getting the crown now than she was 12 months before. And the war's back on, but it's like she nearly did it. And that, although the war carries on for another 13 years, that was the moment that she must have regretted for the rest of it, that she didn't quite get that crown on her head. But in the end, she wins, right? Oh, yes. In the <laughs> end, she wins. Because after, after 1141, there's another incident um, a year or so later, in 1142, actually, yeah, um, where she is... Stephen's ill in Nottingham, having some kind of mental breakdown or physical illness as a result of his imprisonment. She needs reinforcements, so her brother goes to Geoffrey in Normandy to ask for reinforcements. Empress Matilda waits him at Oxford Castle, and it's the middle of winter, snow's on the ground, Stephen suddenly miraculously recovers and besieges her at Oxford Castle. Now, this is a story that in, you couldn't make it up, you know. Historical fiction writers would have been, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> so she's surrounded in Oxford Castle, the Empress, and she needs to get out. So she either go, dresses in white, because it's middle of winter, the snow's falling hard, so she dresses all in white, and depending on the sources, she either escapes through a postern gate of the castle or she is lowered down on a rope from the castle walls, whichever way it is. She and three knights, I think it is, she's accompanied by, escape through the lines. They literally walk through King Stephen's lines. The troops can't see them because they're all dressed in white, camouflaged against the snow in a big snowstorm and they walk to Wallingford Castle to get away and once she's away the garrison at Oxford um, surrender but they weren't going to surrender while they had Empress Matilda in with them so she had to get away in order that they would surrender and it's just it shows the tenacity of the woman that she would walk literally through enemy lines to get away. Robert then comes back from Normandy he doesn't get any reinforcements troop-wise, but he brings Henry with him. Henry's now nine years old, and he is, it's perfect timing, and it's a perfect stage to remind people that they're not fighting just for Empress Matilda. Yes, it's her right to the crown, but she has a son and heir who is Henry I's blood. You know, so if anyone should be king, it's Henry, who would be Henry II. So the focus then gradually shifts so that it's not Empress Matilda fighting for the crown for herself. She, she's there now able to show that she's fighting for the crown for her son. So whereas Queen Matilda of Boulogne had pointed that out in 1141, that it wasn't just Stephen, it was her son Eustace. Empress Matilda now used that and said, actually, it's my son, Henry, and he's got more right to this throne than Stephen or Eustace put together. <laughs> so the focus slightly changes. And I think probably she may have thought, actually, she should have done that in the first place, you know, and said that she was fighting for Henry because it was for her. I, but it must have been hard. I think I would have been exactly the same. I would have been like, it's my throne. It's my crown. I have a right to it rather than I'm doing it for my son. But she does eventually change that around and she passes the bat on to Henry. And I do think that when Henry II is crowned in 1154, it's Empress Matilda's victory. 
Yeah, definitely. I'm sure she felt some ego about it too, with her father naming her yes. his heir. It was hers to take. And then yes. eventually it just took her time to realize, okay, well, this fight, I'm never going to win it. Now it's mm -hmm. time to shift toward my son and, and make him king. Yeah. Sharon, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. I feel like I say this every episode. We could talk about this for probably three hours. Yes, definitely. <laughs> There's just so yes. much to go on. But why don't you, before we go here, why don't you um, let the listeners know, again, the title of your book, um, when it's out and where it'll be available. Right. It's Women of the Anarchy. It's out now in England sorry, in the UK and in Europe, and it's available on Amazon, bookshop.org, good bookshops. Um, apparently, it's available in Wallingford, book, in a bookshop in Wallingford, and at the National Archives, and at Oxford Castle, because I'm doing a talk at Oxford Castle on the 23rd of, of uh, February, which is the actual official book launch, which is going to be great, in the castle that Empress Matilda escaped from I'm doing the launch of the book um it will be out in April in the US and um yeah it's um I'm actually very proud of it and very proud of the fact that uh, every review so far has said she distinguishes really well between the Matildas <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say congratulations on writing this book and researching the lives of these women that maybe many of us had never heard of before, because to me, it's all about bringing these women's stories to light who have just been in yeah. the shadows for far too long. So Sharon, thank you so much for coming on today and listeners go out and grab her book. Thank you very much for having me, Rebecca. It's been lovely to talk about the Empress Matilda and the Queen Matilda. <laughs> Thank you. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast.